Okay, so let's talk about healthcare. That's another thing. I mean, none of us have been to the dentist and we haven't had our physical and there are a number of surgeries canceled. Uh, we have heard a lot uh, from readers about things like knee surgeries and hip uh, surgeries being postponed. Um, but still, we still hear how safe the hospitals are. Uh, you know, don't doctors are warning us, you know, if we have appendicitis, for example, or if we think we have a health issue, we need to go to the emergency room because it's safe there. Uh, so many of our readers want to know how come if it's so safe, why can't we have our hip surgeries or our knee surgeries? So safety is a question of benefits and risk um, and everything in life has risks and everything in life, well, most things in life have benefit as well. And so when we talk about the hospital being a safe place, what we mean is the hospital is the safest place to be if you're sick. The hospital is the safest place to be if you have an emergency. And that's because the risk of not treating it is much higher than the risk of being in the hospital. Your doctor's visits are going to look different as we go forward. There's a lot of extra precautions that are being put into place to accommodate that physical distancing and to employ more vigorous cleaning and better infection control and prevention. So the doctor's not going to be able to see as many appointments in any given day. We're still doing a lot of virtual care here in Toronto, and I think that'll continue for a while yet, which allows us to triage and treat a lot of problems without seeing people in office. But that being said, you're right, there is a large backlog of surgeries and other procedures that can't be done virtually. And unfortunately for the people waiting, we do have to focus on the urgent cases and during these earlier stages of the pandemic. And it's going to take us time to get through this backlog. And it's a real concern and it's not something physicians or the government is unaware of, but it is where we're at right now. We unfortunately can't do purely elective surgeries at the same rate that we were doing them earlier or rather let me phrase that, you can't do purely non-emergent surgeries because I don't think there's any such thing as an elective surgery. The person waiting for their hip would, would, would beg to differ about those wordings. Mm -hmm. But it's, um, it's a question of risk and benefit and it's the question of moving forward with the greatest safety to everyone. So we should be still going to see doctors, if, even if it's a non-emergency, but we, we continue as normal, we get our vaccinations, uh, if we have a funny looking mole, we get that checked. Um, the, it's not like healthcare has stopped. Absolutely. So your doctor's office have stayed open. Healthcare never stopped. Healthcare never closes. That's one of the things that we just don't do. Um, I would suggest that people contact their individual doctor's offices before going in to find out what they need to do, and what protocols are in place at that physician's offices processes and procedures will vary by office. Um, a lot of things can be done socially distanced. So I know dermatologists who are seeing those questionable moles without having people into their offices. And if we can do that, that's certainly safer. As for vaccines, absolutely get your vaccine. In fact, if I can make a plug for making sure even more people get their influenza vaccine this year, it's going to be critical. Mm -hmm. You do not want to have a massive flu wave and a second wave of COVID at the same time. Same time. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk about safety. If you know someone who's had COVID, uh, that's also been a really, really hot topic. So if you know someone who's had COVID, they're, they've had the negative test, they seem to be feeling okay, are, is it okay to, to hang out with that person? Are they, part of, your are they uh, part of your pandemic social circle? <laughs> okay, let's say yes, they are, and then maybe they're not. <laughs> All right, so my answer, and I'll let Nazim take a stab. So if they're part of their pandemic social circle and they are 14 days post the end of symptoms or since their negative uh, COVID swab, then yes, it is safe to hang out with them again. If they are not, not part of your pandemic social circle, then the same rules apply where 14 days post resolution of symptoms or 14 days post negative swab, you can feel free to interact, but please maintain your six foot distance, wear your mask and wash your hands. If I'm not experiencing symptoms, uh, I haven't been tested, but uh, I could be spreading it. I mean, there's been a lot of debate whether or not people who are um, have COVID, but they don't have the symptoms, they're spreading it. Um, is there a bottom line in terms, like, do we know for sure that there are people out there who don't have symptoms that are spreading the virus? Fair enough. Um, I, the short answer is yes, but Nazim, did you want to add more to that? I feel like, like well, you're- I think that yeah, no, I, I think actually, uh, you know, I've seen a number that says 40% uh, of the cases uh, who are positive 
you know, actually has has got that virus from asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic cases. That is actually very high. You know, it ranges from 16 to 40 percent. So, you know, four out of 10 people who actually has been positively diagnosed with uh, with COVID got it from a place that they really don't know, you know, where they got it from. Uh, p- potentially from a asymptomatic, asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, uh, you know, individual. So, yes. Uh, this is the this is one of the biggest issues. This is what what makes COVID uh, the coronavirus to particularly lethal is because of its uh, asymptomatic nature uh, of its spreading. So so this is why I think you know we have been emphasizing throughout this session, you know the social distancing, the cleanliness, etc. You just assume that you know people who you come into contact with or you you yourself might actually could be passing it on or you could be catching it with people you know from people who are not exhibiting uh, symptoms right this sort of reminds me of uh, and this will be the last question in this section but um, it reminds me of the debate that we've had since the very beginning of COVID-19, like we know so little about it still, um, but yeah. the, the debate about masks and, uh, you know, I'm wondering, um, and the debate about the vaccine and the debate about how people spread and whether children are spreaders. And um, and it, I think it's left, uh, just even if any of our letters from our readers are uh, is an indication um, that we don't, don't actually know what to do generally, right? And so I'm wondering, um, you know, in your opinion, do we need more? Uh, we need more focused messaging, or is it already out there, and people are just aren't paying attention? So I'll take a stab at that one. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to push back a little bit on saying that we don't know what to do. We do know what to do. There's a lot of data that's still left to be determined, and a lot of science that's going to evolve as we go forward. But the same rules apply that have applied from the very beginning, which is that, as Nazim has said, you cannot get the virus lives in people. And so if you want to diminish the transmission of the virus, you diminish the contact between people. That's the basic principle behind behind all of these measures. And so we don't do things that are unnecessary, that expose ourselves or other people to risk or to each other. We keep our distance when we are around other people. We try and maintain that six feet longer if you're doing something that's physically active or singing in a choir, you wanna be further away. You wear your mask when you're not sure that you're going to be able to maintain that six foot distance. You wash your hands regularly and you don't touch your face. And when we do this, we make a serious dent in how the virus transmits and how it spreads. Will more information keep coming to us? Absolutely. But that's the message that everyone needs to hear and everyone needs to incorporate. And unfortunately, the back and forth of the science, which is very normal, that's how science progresses, sometimes gets lost in the messaging to the masses. And Dr. Mahajarain, did you no, want to comment I, on I, that? Well, I think that uh, I think Dr. Hill actually laid it out really well. I mean, I think we know uh, quite a bit about this virus, and we even know actually uh, the sort of the bit of natural history. You know, if you were to contract the virus on day zero, let's say, you know, the, within the first five days, three to four, five days, you are going to, if you are going to exhibit any symptoms, you are going to actually exhibit symptoms. You know, during that time. And and then you are going to continue to be infectious, you know, contagious, you know, uh, and then it's come to a resolution between somewhere between you know seven days to twenty one days, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, so I think we know quite a bit about you know this kind of a natural history of you know uh, keeping the virus. Uh, we know how the virus actually propagates inside the body and so on. Um, so I think we know, uh, but the thing is, the, the thing that is confusing, I think, is that people lose the sight of some basic messages. You know, for, you know, for, you know so it's, it is about what Dr. Hill said. It is about distancing. It's about uh, wearing masks when you cannot distance. It's about uh, hand hygiene, you know, and not touching your face, et cetera, you know, and and not fearing the virus. And I think that is very important, uh, respecting it, not fearing the virus, and, and being intelligent about, you know, about this and going about in an intelligent manner, in a rational and intelligent manner.